Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again. It is Tuesday, the 28th of April. We're still sheltering in place here in Bethesda, Maryland. But I think it's a good day for Gross Path Challenge. How about Gross Path Challenge number 70? Are you ready? Let's begin. Slide number one is tissue from a cat. All I'm asking you for is a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay. Time's up. We've talked about cat kidneys before. When you see white lumps in them, you basically have two rule outs. It's either going to be lymphoma or it's going to be feline infectious peritonitis. Feline infectious peritonitis um, tends to track vessels. The aggregates of cells tend to be smaller. Um, we're looking at a great case of lymphoma here that's affecting the cortex in some areas of medulla. It is extending into the renal pelvis. We have some other lesions that are associated uh, with it. We have multiple acute renal infarcts, and we have hydronephrosis. So for full credit, uh, renal lymphoma would be fine, but I want to make sure that you note these other changes here, okay? Looks like that we have a uh, occlusion of a lobular vein at this point. This is an acute venous infarct, we probably have a couple more here, here, and here. And never forget, we have outflow obstruction causing hydronephrosis. The cause of this is feline retrovirus. Um, feline leukemia, as most of us know, is a viral disease. In, we don't see it as much anymore in areas of the world where vaccination of cats for feline leukemia is very common, such as in, in the North America and in Europe, but you can still see it in other parts of the world. Um, when you vaccinate for it, it sort of changes the distribution of disease. It used to be that you would see lymphoma in any organ and the signs are referable to whether it was in the brain or the eye or the liver or whatever. Nowadays, in areas that there is a lot of vaccination, um, we tend mostly to see it manifest in the intestine as T-cell lymphomas, and we just don't have the variety that we used to. Sometimes, at least for pathologists, vaccination programs can take some fun out of the job. Okay, slide number two is tissue from a calf. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, time's up. One of my favorite lesions uh, in all pathology is seen in calves um, with spontaneous or also known as calf, calf hood lymphoma. We are looking at areas of uh, cellular infiltration and infarction in the vertebra of this calf. And it always forms in the bone of calves, this beautiful sort of mosaic pattern and nothing else really looks like it. You see this mosaic in, in the uh, marrow of any bone in a calf, you want to think about calf foot lymphoma. This is not one that is part of the enzootic bovine leukosis complex that is caused by viral retroviral infection. So uh, the morphologic diagnosis would be vertebral lymphoma, and that would be absolutely fine. These animals may get pancytopenic, um, there is sort of a range of, uh, they may have tumors in the lymph, uh, the hematopoietic organs, such as the thymus as well. But it usually does involve the bone marrow in these cats. Slide number three is an oldie but a goodie, and this is a dog. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, time's up. Brain tumors can be sort of hard to differentiate from each other. So when I put one on a test, I tend to go for the, the ones that are fairly easy to identify. We are looking at one in the cerebral hemisphere. And there are a couple of things I want you to notice about it. Number one, it's pretty well demarcated from the surrounding tissue. This either means that it's totally a different type of tissue um, or that in the brain, it is a slow growing expansile neoplasm. Uh, fast growing ones tend to have a, a very indistinct border. You often will see hemorrhage in them. You can't tell where the brain 
uh, proper ends and the tumor begins. But this one, because it's growing slowly, it tends to be pushing everything to the side. Uh, we do have a little bit of herniation here of the uh, cingulate gyrus. Uh, the midline is pushed to the side. I'm betting we have some edema ventral to it. But uh, the other thing about this neoplasm I want you to, to look at is it has a relatively gelatinous appearance. appearance. Now this is characteristic of low-grade oligodendrogliomas. These are tumors of oligodendrocytes. They make myelin, and so they have a lot of sort of this gooey myelin-like appearance. It's not wrapping around nerves, but the cells are surrounded by this material. Um, characteristically, these have been called uh, chicken wire looking uh, tumors under the microscope. Uh, so they have a characteristic appearance. Over the last couple of years, there's been a push to try to bring the classification of dog brain tumors closer to that of human brain tumors. Uh, over the years, there have been many different types of tumors and uh, some with crazy names like glioglioma and gliomatosis cerebri and it was a very difficult to classify. The classification now is getting much less and uh, um, there was a very nice paper written by a group that's headed by Dr. Drew Miller and Dr. Jay Kohler um, which gives a classification system essentially lumps the vast majority of these tumors into low and high grade astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas. Okay, not four classifications of astrocytomas like they used to be, which uh, it was easy to identify the highest grade, but not so much one, two, or three. Now it's just low grade or high grade. And I recommend everybody get a copy of that. Also gives a very nice review of different types of immunos that you can use to differentiate these tumors and how fixation will affect each one because they can be very laid by. So this is a classic gross appearance of a low-grade oligodendroglioma arising in the white matter of the cerebrum. Slide number four is tissue from a snake. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and two possible causes? Okay, time's up. Now, I'm sure a lot of you who have more familiarity than I do with uh, reptilian pathology, probably very mad when all I would do is call it a snake, and I didn't say, well, it's a rattlesnake, or it's a, it's a, a colubrid, or it's a boa, or whatever, but I was trying to, uh, to make a point here. So it's a snake, and um, we are looking at the lung. Remember that the lung is a tubular organ, pretty much like everything else in the snake. It has a very large, uh, primary bronchus, and what we're looking at is we're looking at the, the uh, fabiolar tissue, uh, which sort of represents the alveoli in snakes. They don't have alveoli proper, or they don't have terminal bronchioles, so the anatomy is a little different, and I apologize if I get any of it incorrect. Um, but what we can tell, even if we're not that great on the anatomy of the lung of the snake, is that there is a tremendous amount of exudate in here. There may also be some necrotic debris. And if you look at a lot of lungs, um, you would see that the, the fabiola appear thickened and a bit proliferative. But the main thing that I think everybody should be able to get out of this slide is that there is a lot of exudate. Okay, there are two different uh, families of virus that cause uh, viral pneumonia in snakes. Uh, the first one was identified many years ago primarily in poisonous snakes like uh, vipers and the rattlesnakes is one that's called Ophidian paramyxovirus. Um, it causes, like many of the paramyxovirus, a proliferative pneumonia with hyperplasia of pneumocytes and lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. 
Um, like some of the other paramyxoviruses, it also will cause the formation of intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies, which is a nice and helpful diagnostic feature. Like any of these viral a, uh, pneumonias of snakes, these can also be complicated by uh, gram-negative bacterial infections or secondary bacterial infections, sort of like a dog with distemper also getting a, a severe bacterial pneumonia. So that might be contributing to this as well. Okay, so we have the Ophidian pyramix of ours. The second one is a much more recent uh, arrival on the scene, primarily affecting boas. And it is also a viral agent that causes a proliferative and lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia uh, called NIDO virus. There are a number of them that have been identified in various species of snakes, the rainbow boa, NIDO virus, and others that are relegated to uh, one particular species. Um, these do not have the cytoplasmic conclusions. And one thing that they often have will be more extensive necrosis in the uh, oral cavity and the GI tract, particularly uh, esophagus as well. Um, obviously, diagnosis is going to be based on identifying the virus via PCR, but on gross uh, description uh, diagnosis, you want to look for the nidovirus's predilection for a more severe uh, oral cavity infection as well. Once again, these both can be complicated by bacterial infections on top of them. Um, the other thing I was going to mention about the Ophidian paramyx of viruses, it was initially identified in, uh, in vipers and, and rattlesnakes, pit vipers, uh, but over time more and more uh, colubrids or boas have been uh, identified with this virus as well. So the more we know about it, the more species uh, are infected with it. And that's probably going to be the case with the nidoviruses as well. So nidovirus or paramyxovirus both cause viral pneumonia in snakes. Slide number five is tissue from a horse. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. We are looking at the colon from a horse. There are areas of ulceration. There is a lot of edema going on. This will be a diffuse necrotizing colitis. Now, the mucosa is edematous. Um, there, are, there are these foci of hemorrhage and necrosis. It is not sloughed off. Um, so when I think about necrotizing colitis, I go a couple of different ways in uh, a horse. Uh, one of the things that can always cause a necrotizing colitis, and you cannot rule it out just about in any sick-looking gut from a horse, is going to be salmonella typhimuria. Um, salmonella in the horse is a great imposter. It can look like anything. It can be areas of diffuse fibronecrotic exudate. It could be simple edema. It could be edema with multifocal hemorrhages. It can look just like anything. And so I think when you're faced with a sick looking colon in a horse, especially on a certification examination um, where you can't smell it, or it usually smells fairly rank, um, Salmonella typhimurium has got to be on your list. Okay, that's not what this one is. Um, this actually is a disease that uh, we don't see too much anymore. And it is caused by a bacterium called Neorickettsia rustichii. And it, the name of the disease is Potomac horse fever, also known as the Shasta River crud. I always like that name. And it is a bacterial infection primarily hits the colon. These animals often don't die. They get severe watery diarrhea. They may develop endotoxemia, subsequent laminitis. It is seen in certain parts of the country, usually near water. It's thought to be spread by uh, damselflies, of all things. And this bacterium will infect both the colonic enterocytes and also the large numbers of macrophages which um, 
eventually infiltrate this organ. So uh, this is one that I want to put it out there because it's a disease that you should be familiar with, um, but it, it's a difficult, gross diagnosis and not really a very common disease overall. So the Potomac horse fever. And since I live here very close to uh, uh, the Potomac, I just wanted to put that one in there so everyone could see it. Slide number six is from an ox. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. We are looking at a multifocal hemorrhage and necrosis. You can see some of these are sort of eaten away. Uh, the papilla, the cheek papilla in the, uh, in the ox. So this would be multifocal coalescing necrotizing stomatitis will be absolutely just fine. Whenever you think and you see something like that, and you see ulcers in the mouth, in the oral cavity, uh, whether it is around the gingiva, whether it is on the tongue or in other parts of the mouth, the first thing that you want, I want to just think about is going to be bovine pestivirus, the causative agent of mucosal disease in cattle. And we talked a number of times about pathogenesis of mucosal disease, the need for the calf to be infected in utero by a non-cytopathogenic strain, so it recognizes this itself when later on in life, uh, probably within the first two years, it's going to become infected by a cytopathic strain that goes through the, uh, goes through the herd. The animals that were not infected and didn't tolerate it um, will get diarrhea. The ones that were immunotolerant will get mucosal disease. The one thing about uh, bovine pestivirus and susceptible animals um, that will develop mucosal disease is it causes epithelial necrosis. And it's not just epithelium of the GI tract, although that is the classic lesions. You'll also see it as epithelium of the skin. And anywhere that you have a lot of friction, um, whether it is uh, walking, so you'll see necrosis between the toes. Uh, you might see it around the perineum from moving. Any, anywhere you have friction, and of course, when the animal is chewing and swallowing roughage, there's a lot of friction. Um, so you're going to see uh, gingivitis. That's a great ulcerative gingivitis is a great lesion. This is also a good lesion because there's a lot of friction uh, involved with chewing roughage, and so the friction causes the necrotic epithelium to break down and you have sloughing of the epithelium in that area. So uh, for anyone taking a certification exam, I can pretty much guarantee you, I will bet you a dollar to a donut, that you will have some image of bovine pestivirus on your exam because it does so many different things in calves and adult animals with mucosal disease that it, it's, there are lesions in just about every organ system, and this is just a nice one to remind us that there is more to the GI tract than the esophagus and the intestine, at least as far as pestivirus is concerned. This is slide number seven, and it is tissue from a sheep. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. This is a classic lesion. Although I think there are other causes of this lesion that are probably more common in real life. We are looking at the heart and we are looking at the base of the pulmonary artery. There's multiple hemorrhage at the base of the pulmonary artery. And the, the morphologic diagnosis would be pulmonary artery hemorrhage. The cause, at least the textbook cause, is going to be ovine orbivirus, the cause of agent of blue tongue. This is one of the classic lesions, classic sites of hemorrhage in blue tongue, although you will have hemorrhage throughout the animal's body. You will have cyanosis and necrosis, hemorrhage throughout the uh, GI tract, um, but this is an absolutely classic uh, lesion. Not seen in a whole lot of cases of blue tongue, but it is seen in a whole lot of textbooks when we describe blue tongue. So this is something that you need to know for your examination. And if I saw this on a test, I'm just going to write down uh, ovine ovivirus, name the disease, blue tongue. I think that you can also see this in enterotoxemia in sheep. Probably that's a real life thing. 
it's probably uh, more common. Uh, enrotoxemia caused by clostridium perfringens type D, which uh, uh, has a epsilon toxin, which when it gets into the bloodstream can cause hemorrhage and necrosis in a number of areas. And you often will see hemorrhage in blood vessels. So that's another possibility. But once you, if you ever see lesions of hemorrhage in the great vessels to say, oh, it's gotta be blue tongue, call a state vet, get everybody upset. Um, especially if there are other lesions that suggest enterotoxemia um, in these animals. So make sure that you know that's a possibility and not every case of uh, arterial hemorrhage is gonna be blue tongue. Here's a pretty slide for slide number eight. This is tissue from a turtle. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a likely cause? And let's, for fun, name the disease. Okay, time's up. We have multifocal coalescing areas of plastron keratinocyte necrosis. There are a number of ways that you can put a morphologic diagnosis, and if you put that on there, I think I would accept that. This is also one of the manifestations of a disease called septicemic cutaneous ulcerative disease. So if you wanted to say that this multifocal coalesc coalescing plastron vasculitis with epidermal infarction, that would be absolutely fine too. Um, this is a condition that is seen in a lot of animals that undergo poor husbandry. Seems like every time I bring up a slide of a turtle, I would say this is caused by poor husbandry. Dirty water, poor nutrition. Um, and it can simply start out as a skin or shell disease. And you can isolate a lot of different organisms from it. You know, animals kept in dirty water often get lesions um, that are contaminated with the same bacteria that populate the water. This can be initiated also by uh, conspecific aggression, which is you know, other turtles, you know, taking in instances like to these animals. So it can be shell and skin only, um, but it can also become septicemic, and that's how it got its name, septicemic cutaneous ulcerative disease. In that disease, SCUD, which has a great acronym, you can also see uh, abscesses within the salomic cavity in the liver and the, uh, the spleen because it's a septicemic disease. Two uh, bacteria that have been repeatedly isolated from this, um, the classic is Citrobacter freundii. Uh, there's only two times I ever think about Citrobacter freundii in turtles and in mice uh, with proliferative uh, enteritis. But Citrobacter freundii is a good one. Uh, another one that has been a gram negative that's been identified over the years is uh, serratia. Serratia in or along with Benecchia or some, because they're thought to be somewhat synergistic or by itself. So serratia is another one I think that you can get. Aeromonas and Pseudomonas out of some of these cases as well. This is septicemic cutaneous ulcerative disease. I like the vasculitis approach. Um, so plastron vasculitis with overlying cutaneous infarction. You know, there's a lot of vasculitis out there that we don't always pick up on. So they're great morphologic diagnosis to think through. When you have one of these dermal vasculitides, you need to split it into two parts. Okay. Slide number nine is tissue from a pig. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Hint, hint, how's your short-term memory? And a cause. Okay, time's up. This is an oldie, but a goodie. We see multiple rhomboidal infarcts over the animal's entire body. It's a classic case of diamondback disease in a pig, okay? This is the prototypical case that you want to call this 
multifocal to coalescing dermal vasculitis with epidermal infarction or dermal vasculitis with dermal and epidermal infarction. All of these rhomboidal areas represent a single dermatome, which is supplied by a vessel, which is right in the middle. And if you could go in right now and take a section through the middle of this, through the center, you would see that that vessel is thrombosed. And if you apply a gram stain to that slide, you would see bacteria in the thrombus. And if you cultured it, it would be erysipelothrix bruseopathy. It's not just a skin disease. This will cause uh, vasculitis and thrombosis in multiple organs as well. But it's a classic case of vasculitis with infarction of the overlying tissue. We see these all over the place. If, if you think about uh, lactic acidosis and the sequela, you will get ulcers in the rumen or the omasum. Uh, or the reticulum, and it's the exact same thing. This is, would be a ruminal vasculitis with mucosal infarction. So we tend not to see it as often as presented to us, but there are a lot of great lesions out there, and this is one of the best. So dermal vasculitis with epidermal infarction cause erysipelothrix bruseopathy. Finally, our last, and I don't know how many, how all these reptiles got on one test, but our last slide uh, for today is going to be tissue from an iguana. And you name the condition and give me two possible causes. Okay, time's up. This jaw is way too big. Okay, the condition is fibrous osteodystrophy. The name of the, of the disease is metabolic bone disease. Sort of covers a wide variety of things in multiple species, not very specific, but this is what they call metabolic bone disease in iguanas. I like it for fibrous osteodystrophy. Um, some old time uh, zoo pathologists probably call it rubber jaw because there is very little mineral in this jaw that has been resorbed. This animal, there's two ways to do it. And in, in pet green iguanas, one of the most common ways is to uh, uh, feed it poorly, to feed it a diet because they like vegetables, um, to feed it a diet which is deficient in calcium or vitamin D. Uh, another thing that uh, will cause this lesion on animals that are getting a well-balanced diet with sufficient vitamin D um, and calcium is a lack of UVB light. Remember, ultraviolet light is required to activate vitamin D and and these iguanas require adequate amounts of UVB. So without access to that particular wavelength of light, you can end up with fibrous osteodystrophy. Remember, fibrous osteodystrophy reflects a systemic need for calcium. The bones are always a very good uh, storehouse of calcium. It can be used to uh, bring calcium into the blood um, for critical absolutely critical functions in muscle and in other organs. Um, and the storehouse, this storehouse is very good until it is not a storehouse. Um, and, and all of it's taken out of the bones. So you get, a, uh, you get bones that are thickened, that may be rubbery or brittle. So this is fibrous osteodystrophy in a, an iguana. And I think that brings us to the end of today's gross path challenge. Okay, it's Tuesday. So this will be the last one. Tomorrow we are going to have the results of the Wednesday slide conference from the JPC, which I will put up on uh, our Facebook page. It's going to be a break for a day, not really because uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that on Wednesdays. But I'm want to make sure that everybody gets something uh, on a daily basis to stimulate your mind, make you think about pathology, and then we'll be back on Thursday with another Gross Path Challenge. Thanks for spending some time with me today, and uh, I will be back and see you all on Thursday.